you know, the Bible tells you you can't separate a fool from his folly. Sorry about that. It's only the first 20 minutes. Look at verse 14. Did someone on the web tell you that? At least one person's listening. <laughs> now watch. I'll go for five minutes and someone will say, can you turn the mic off? <laughs> Verse 14, if any man's work abide, do you see how it starts with the word if? See, there's an uncertainty there. It's to be determined based upon how the man lives. If any man's work abide, which he hath built upon, he shall receive a reward. So here's what happens. You get saved today, 2019, whenever it is. You're blessed with all spiritual blessings at that point in time. That's your inheritance. Your reward is, is determined at the judgment seat of Christ, and it will be determined on the basis of what you do between now and then. That's the way you need to think about it. Look at the next, next row. Get Ephesians chapter 1. We looked at this earlier, but let's just look at it again for confirmation. Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, what cross-reference tells you that you can't lose the Holy Spirit? Now, think with me for a minute. Do you know of anyone in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit came upon and then departed from? Saul, right? So the Holy Spirit clearly came upon Saul and then left him. So what you might ponder is, well, okay, well, the, the Holy Spirit indwells the believer at salvation, but, you know, maybe I'm going to mess things up and, and, you know, lose it. Look at me at Ephesians 4, verse 30. Ephesians 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That verse tells you you can't lose it because you're sealed by the Holy Spirit for how long? To the day of redemption, where's that? The adoption to wit the redemption of the body, Romans 8.23. Now, Ephesians 4.30 is actually very instructive because it tells us something. Where it says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, here's what happens. The moment you believe the gospel, you're eternally saved. The Holy Spirit indwells you. The Holy Spirit will seal you to the day of redemption, meaning the Holy Spirit continually resides in the believer. Now have a little bit of sympathy for the Holy Spirit. You know what the Holy Spirit's daily experience is? The Holy Spirit resides in me. The Holy Spirit, by definition, is holy. And the Holy Spirit has to put up with my nonsense. Right? I mean, when it says grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, here's what honestly happens, no joke. The Holy Spirit resides in every believer and spends a great deal of his time in frustration and grief. Why? Because believers choose not to live the way they should. And what does that cause the Holy Spirit? Grief. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't leave. With Saul, did the Holy Spirit leave? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit leave a believer today? No, because you're sealed into the day of redemption. So give a brother a break and quit grieving the Holy Spirit. Right? I mean, in all seriousness, we ought to do that. Praise God that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We're sealed and we can't lose it. And just out of sheer gratitude, we ought to not annoy him to death. But we honestly do quite a bit of that. Go back to Ephesians 1. Now notice what this says. So verse 13, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, which is the earnest. It's the down payment. It's the foretaste of our inheritance. In other words, we're given the Holy Spirit as an advance sampling, as a guarantee of the future inheritance that we have. Now think about that. Think how awesome that inheritance must be if the Holy Spirit is just the down payment. 
Praise God. Look with me on the right-hand side, reward. Get 1 Corinthians 3. First Corinthians three, verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned. Now I should just mention this. Some people think the judgment seat of Christ is simply an evaluation of the believer's doctrine as to whether their doctrine was sound. But when you read first Corinthians three, what word does it keep using? work, right? 2 Timothy 2.15 says a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. You know what, fundamentally what a workman does? He works. 1 Corinthians 3 says the fire shall try every man's work. Verse 15 says if any man's work. So what is the judgment of the judgment seat of Christ. It is obviously a judgment of the believer's work. That is what is being evaluated. Now, verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. What 1 Corinthians 3.15 seems to contemplate is that there will be believers who receive no reward. They'll receive an inheritance for sure because that's guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. But in terms of reward, there are some that will suffer loss of reward. And so we should take that very, very seriously. Look with me at Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2, look at verse 18. Colossians 2.18. Let no man beguile you of your reward. Look at that. You can lose your reward by being beguiled. Then notice what it says. In a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Then notice what it says. Intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So there's a lot in that verse. The first thing is this. Can you be tricked out of your reward? Plainly, you can. You can be beguiled out of it. You can be deceived. Well, how can you be beguiled out of it? Well, it's, it's, it's based upon some choices you make. Now, notice this. In a voluntary humility... And then notice what it says, and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. It seems to me the following is the case. If you look at the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, there's something of an obsession with angels. There's Christian fiction written about them. There's whole TV shows, you know, touched by an angel. And there's, a, there's this notion of people interacting with angels in their daily lives. You may have known people that talk about seeing them or having experiences. What does Colossians 2.18 actually say? Intruding into those things which he hath, and what's the next word? Not seen. Now, if Colossians 2.18 is right, then every experience you hear, every anecdote, every story, Paul actually would call those things fables are not true. And I realize there's people that have shows and radio programs and books and all these things about their experiences with angels. But what Colossians 2.18 unmistakably says is, intruding into those things, and I'm just going to quote it verbatim, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. So it hasn't been seen. People are, I, I, I don't have to judge their motives or explain it, but the fact is it didn't happen. What does the last part of that verse say? What's the 
underlying driving force. Vainly, something that's vain is empty and arrogant. Vainly puffed up by what? It's fleshly mind. Well, that's, that's unkind to say. The problem is with the scriptures then, right? Because that's what the scriptures say. See, here's the thing. The, the, imagine being in God's shoes just for a minute. He records a book. He preserves it throughout time to tell us exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And we spend the vast majority of our time doing other than what we're told to do. And you wonder why the world's a mess. Well, it's because we're not paying any attention to the things that we have been told to do. Now, let me see if I can find this here. I want to share this with you. So I'm going to read to you here from the uh, English Standard Version. And, and many of the modern versions will read similar to this, but I'm just going to read this one to you. Here's what Colossians 2.18 says. Tell me if you notice a difference. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. The, the ESV is not as good as what the NIV says there, but it suggests that the person actually saw it. Whereas Colossians 2.18 in the King James says what? Intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Get Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So what Colossians 1.12 is telling us is that God has made us meet. He's made us fitting to partake of the inheritance. In other words, everything that is necessary for us to inherit from God the Father, God took care of it. On my own, was I worthy to inherit anything? No. But am I complete in Christ so that now I'm a son and an heir? I am. So God has made the body of Christ sufficient. He's made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Look with me at 2 Timothy 4. What hopefully you're seeing is that when we look at inheritance, you've already received it. You can't lose it. God has taken care of all of it for you. You already possess it. it it's, a, it's as done a deal as a deal can be done. It's resolved. But what you should be seeing about the reward issue is the reward issue is unresolved. We're going to decide that ourselves. We're going to decide that by what our works are and what they aren't. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Now you're probably familiar with this, but in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, as, as Paul writes to Timothy, he shares with Timothy some of the challenges he has, and it's not all smooth sailing. Paul faces some opposition, and he faces some betrayal by, by folks that he works closely with. 2 Timothy 4, verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Notice what Paul says here. The Lord reward him according to his works. Now he's not saying he wants the guy to go to hell, right? Paul says in, in Romans that he wishes he could be accursed for Israel's sake. He's not saying he wants Alexander the coppersmith to go to hell. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that Alexander should be rewarded and he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ for his works. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians 5, 
verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So we're all going to show up there. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. I don't know about you, but that scares me, right? In other words, the beauty of grace is God, I'm a sinner. I deserve judgment. I can't earn your favor. Grace bestows salvation as a free gift. It solves all of my problems. Hallelujah. The judgment seat of Christ is not about grace, right? The judgment seat of Christ is, what are your works? Some good, some bad. You'll be rewarded according to it. So it's, it's, it's sobering. Get with me Galatians 6. As, as you think about life, here's my suggestion for you. You've probably seen stats like this, but what will happen today is people will see more images because of TV and other things. They'll see more images, and I can't remember if it's a month or a year or whatever it is, than people 100 years ago would see in their lifetime, right? And modern life is busy. We have all sorts of demands on our time. And we have these things that command our attention at every moment. And so what modern life is, is it's full of activity and it's full of stuff. But the vast majority, really almost everything, just doesn't matter. Let me put it this way. Anything that you can see or touch, you know is not eternal, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What are the things in the universe that are eternal? My list would be three. God is eternal. His word is eternal. And the souls of men are eternal. Other than that, it's not eternal, right? What's actually going to happen to this earth? I probably shouldn't say this, but it'd be like the thousandth thing I probably shouldn't say. So we're, we're past that at this point. But recycling is not going to save the earth. What's going to happen to this earth? The elements are going to pass away because they're going to melt with the fervent heat, right? And if you think that by your efforts, you're going to preserve this earth for one second longer than God wants, you're not being realistic, right? And what happens is we have this incredible focus, because we're very visual creatures, on stuff that we can see and touch and interact with, but anything you can see or touch is not eternal because it's going to disappear. Matter is going to go away. Think, think of it this way. I'm actually really thrilled God is doing that. You know why? If God just took this earth and sort of gave it a good washing, it's not going to be enough, right? I mean, this earth is full of garbage and pollution all over the place. And it would be horrible if that's where people had to stay for all eternity. So what God appropriately does in his timing is, I'm done with that, right? And he creates a new one, which tells you everything that you see, you touch, you interact with. It can't be that important because it's not even going to be here. And so what's incumbent upon us then is to invest in the invisible things that are going to endure, that are eternal. Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Get 2 Corinthians 4. Second Corinthians 4, verse 17. If I had to pick... A single verse that is my favorite verse would be 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 
So everything in your life that right now seems like a huge struggle, it's not, right? The things that we carry we think are huge in the light of eternity. They just don't really amount to anything. Now look at verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So where should the focus of our time be? Obviously the things that are not seen. So go to the bottom of the page here, and I'll just sum up here the, the difference between the two before we transition to something. So for an inheritance, inheritance is received 100% by grace. It's resolved at the time of salvation. It's received by virtue of being a son of God, and all saints receive an inheritance. That ought to be very comforting. That ought to be very reassuring. It's resolved. All you have, all you have to do there is you have faith in Christ. You have an inheritance. All's good. The right-hand side is reward, and reward we need to focus our attention on. Reward is based 100% on works. It's resolved at the judgment of the seat of Christ. Not now, when you got saved, but at the judgment seat of Christ. It depends on one's work or labor, and some saints receive a reward, some suffer loss. So do we need to take that seriously? The, the answer is that we do. Now go back to 1 Corinthians 3, if you would. I now want to take up a couple verses after the judgment seat of Christ. And these verses often trouble folks, so I, I thought it would be good to cover it. So in, we left off in verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Now look with me at verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, verse 17 bothers a lot of folks because what they fear is they fear they've defiled the temple of God. And the, their thought is, well, I've done things to my body that maybe I've, maybe I've done what that verse is talking about. And it says those that defile the temple of God, what's he going to do? He's going to destroy them. Well, that sounds like something I wouldn't want. So maybe I've done something that would cause me to be implicated by that verse. Now just pause for a minute. When you come across a verse like that that's un unclear, what you don't want to do is let it take away the clarity you have elsewhere, right? In other words, there's a whole host of verses that tell you that salvation is by grace through faith. There's numerous verses that tell you, including verse 15, by the way, that salvation is an eternal matter, that you can't lose it. I personally think 1 Corinthians 3.15 is one of the best eternal security verses because there's someone that shows up at the judgment seat of Christ, they have a complete loss of rewards, and the verse then specifically tells you, he himself shall be saved. So there's multiple verses and multitude of reasons how you know eternal security exists for the believer. So whatever's going on in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and 17 doesn't mean you don't have eternal security. But nonetheless, let's try to understand what's going on in those verses. Get with me Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28 is the single most important principle as to how to study the Bible. Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Here's what Isaiah 28 is telling you. 
The way God has designed the scriptures is that there are a series of interlocking verses, if you will, in different places, here a little, there a little, that need to be lined up together to reveal the picture. It's almost as if you're taking jigsaw pieces and you, well, you just look at one piece or you throw all the pieces on the table in disorder. What does it mean? But if you fit them together in the right places, the picture becomes clear. The Bible is very different from an encyclopedia. An encyclopedia has articles, right? So if you, if, you're, if you want to understand, let's just say, the Civil War, you pull... Some of you here probably don't even know what encyclopedias are. <laughs> Let me tell you about this thing we used to have. They would go A to Z, and they would have letters. And so if you wanted to learn about the Civil War, you would grab C. And if you wanted to learn about President Polk, you would grab P. And there would be an article in there that would tell you everything that the set was going to say about the Civil War or about Polk or whatever. In other words, everything was put in one place. What Isaiah 28 just told you is the Bible is the opposite of that. The Bible is here a little and there a little. So the critical thing, the, one of the basic reasons you need to study the Bible is if you were to say, what do I need to know about the rapture? What chapter should I go to? Well, there's not a chapter. You have to read 1 Thessalonians 4. You have to read 1 Corinthians 15. It'd be helpful to read 2 Corinthians 5 because there are different verses in different places that all deal with that subject. You see? And so it's here a little and there a little. So the key in Bible study is to continually search possible cross-references till you find the one that gives you clarity. Let me contrast that with something. I see this all the time. I can't tell you how many times I'll be in a Bible study environment and someone will be going through a passage and someone will go to the bottom of the page and read me a study footnote and tell me that's the answer. Really? The footnotes are put there by men. There are some, some study Bibles that are better than others, but for the most part, they're not helpful. Because what's happening is this. There's a verse that's vague. I want to know the answer, and I want to know the answer now. So can I just have the cheat sheet, please? Let me just look at the answer key at the bottom of the page. What you're getting at the bottom of the page is a man's opinion as to what it means. What would be far more useful is a citation to the correct cross-reference. So when, when study Bibles have a citation to a cross-reference, if it's a good cross-reference, it's tremendously helpful. If it's not, it's not. Okay. Now, what I'm, what I'm telling you then simply is this. As you study the Bible in your own time, it's very simple what you need to do. As you're reading a passage and something's unclear, the, the, the basic things to do, the first thing to do is to pick up a dictionary. Because a lot of times what happens is we don't understand words, just to be honest with you. Or we have an understanding of the word that is imprecise or different from what the word means. So you look up in the dictionary what the word means. The second thing you do is you read the context. So a lot of times people grab a verse. Well, it would be relevant to read the verses before it and the verses after it to understand the lay of the land and what's going on. And then what you do, and this is the, the part that I think is often overlooked, is you search the cross-references till you find the one that gives you clarity. Sometimes people use the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge, which has a bunch of cross-references. That's fine to do that. What I find to be the most useful thing to do is to just run a word search. And so I tell you all that. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 3 for a minute. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Now that verse bothered me for a long time because so I couldn't figure out what it meant. And I couldn't find the right cross-reference. And then finally one day I realized what the right cross-reference was. Get Psalm 79. Psalm 79, and this is amazing to me because there are only two verses in the Bible 
that use the word temple and defile in the same verse. Meaning, I should have found this verse within 12 seconds, right? Because if I want to understand what the defiling of the temple of God is, gee, it's not that hard with the computer program. Type in defile asterisk, temple asterisk. There's only two. This other one might be relevant. So look with me. Psalm 79, verse 1. O oh God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. Well, what's Psalm 79 verse 1 talking about? Who are the heathen in Psalm 79? Gentiles, right? The heathen have come into thine inheritance, thy holy temple have they defiled. Now, if you think about the Old Testament, there is a very clear separation between Jew and Gentile. When you think about what Ephesians 2 says, it describes Gentiles in times past as being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. Very sharp distinction. Look what Psalm 79.1 does. I would tell you it gives you the definition of what it means when the holy temple is defiled. It is the heathen coming into thine inheritance. In other words, did God want Gentiles to enter into the temple? No. I mean, they were specifically not to do that. When they did that, they defiled the temple. So the defiling of the temple in Psalm 79 is clearly a reference to Gentiles entering into it. Now go back with me to 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians 3. First Corinthians chapter three, verse 16. Now, a lot of times what happens is we gloss right over prepositions. Very foolish of us to do that. I'm sure I do that too, but it's not a good thing to do. So verse 16, know ye. So ye is second person, right? I, me, my, you, your, yours. So ye is second person. Now let me just show you this in case you're not aware of this. A lot of people will talk about the King James is full of archaic language and it's so confusing to understand as if people don't know what the and thou is. But just so you know, the distinction between thou and thee and ye and you is actually quite helpful. Whenever you see ye and you, it's plural. So if I say, I'm happy to see you, that is a statement, I'm happy to see multiple people. Ye uh, is also plural. Thou and thee are singular. The difference between these two rows is whether the noun is the subject or an object or the object. So for example, if you say, I hit the ball, I is the subject, the ball is the object. Is there a big difference between the subject or the object of the verb? <laughs> yes, there is. So whenever you, you look at the King James English, what happens in modern English is it looks like this. This is inferior to this. This reveals each time the pronoun is used, whether it's singular or plural, and whether it's the subject or the object. Okay? Now look at verse 16. Know ye not. Okay, so based on what we just learned, we know that that's plural. We know that that's second person, and it's the subject. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. So the temple of God 
in 1 Corinthians 3.16 is, is you, it's the believers. There are sometimes people think the church is a building. The church is a group of believers assembled. The church sometimes meets in a building, but the building is not a church. That's just a sort of sloppy way of, of saying things that, that we do. Now notice what it says, and that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So the group of believers is the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in them, which makes sense based upon everything we saw earlier in Ephesians 1. Now look at verse 17. If any man, in verse 16, we were in second person, you. So first person is I, me, my. Second person is you, your, yours. Third person is he, she, them. Right? If any man that's third person, defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye, second person, are. See how there's a distinction between you, second person, and any man, third person. We saw in Psalm 79 that the defiling of the temple were unbelievers entering in, right? So it's clear what's going on in 1 Corinthians 3. What's going on in 1 Corinthians 3, where it says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. What happens if an unbeliever joins the assembly of believers? Well, hopefully what happens is they get saved and they become a believer. And then according to verse 16, they're part of the temple of God. What happens if someone is part of an assembly and they're there for a long time and so on, but they never come to faith? Does it do you any good? I mean, you've no doubt heard this, but people all the time say, well, I wish my children were in church. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but what do they need? To, they need to be saved, right? simply being part of the assembly without being saved, what ends up happening? They end up destroyed because they're, they end up treated just like any other lost man. So 1 Corinthians 3.17, him shall God destroy, is not something that should be scary to a believer, but what it is a, a caution about is that it's not enough to be in church. You have to be saved. Now, and, and by the way, I'll just say this. There are all kinds of examples, all kinds of instances where people are in a church for a long time because it's a cultural thing or it's a, it's a, it's a relationship thing. But if you never come to faith, it just it doesn't do any good. So that's the way to understand verse 17. It's a verse that people sometimes struggle with because they're fearful that, well, if I take drugs and I defile the temple of God, that God will harm me or something like that. No, that's not what that verse is talking about. It's talking about unbelievers that are part of the assembly is what it's talked about. So let me just, I'll wrap up with this. There's simply two things you have to get from what we looked at today. Salvation's a free gift. You can have it in an instant. All you have to do is trust that Christ died on the cross for your sins. The moment you quit relying upon your own works and effort and you trust what Christ did for you, God saves you forever. You have an, you have an, an inheritance that is eternal that you cannot lose from that moment. Hallelujah. You've solved the fundamental issue of life by trusting what Christ did for you on the cross. If you haven't done that, you need to do that today. You need to do that really right now before you drive. Because people drive like nitwits and you just don't want to get out on the road. Once you resolve that question, then what else matters, right? Well, here's what matters. What matters is between now and then, you have a bunch of moments. The Lord Jesus Christ did not save us because he wanted us to watch more TV. There's a purpose for our lives. And we need to understand that purpose from the scriptures. And we need to build on the right foundation with the right materials. We do that, the judgment seat of Christ will be a time of reward. If we don't do that, it will be what 
1 Corinthians 3 calls loss and what 2 Timothy 2, 15 calls ashamed. And no, no one wants that. So we just need to be busy about doing the work the Lord would have us to do. So we covered a bunch of stuff this morning. Um, so let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for preserving it for us. We thank you for the clarity that your word gives us. We pray that you would be glorified in all we do. We pray that each day we would have a better understanding of, of your blessings. We would have a better understanding of the work that, that you have for us. We just rejoice in salvation. We rejoice it's a free gift. We rejoice that the Holy Spirit has sealed us and that we can't lose our salvation. We rejoice that we have an inheritance and all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, it's in his name we pray. Amen.